Reginald here. The gaming industry is in shambles. Let's just be honest about it, things aren't very exciting right now. There's very few new titles coming into the market that look promising. Not none, but mostly things are looking pretty rough. If you're looking for something new to do, I do have some options for you. The kind of options you probably haven't thought about in years. Real-time strategy games. Now I know that's not everyone's cup of tea, but at least hear me out, so if it catches your fancy you can give it a shot. I have got a newbie on the scene that is completely free to play, and an oldie you need to know about, and something new, cool on the horizon that I just heard about. Two of the titles are very similar in some ways, but different in others. Beyond All Reason and Supreme Commander. I'm going to try and summarize this quick so you can get into it if you like it and leave if you don't. These two games represent a subgenre of RTS I like to call actual real-time strategy games. The difference between this kind of game and a typical RTS has to do with scale. These games are designed not with tight little micro-heavy combat groups of 10 or 20 dudes in mind, but with many mile-wide maps and hundreds to thousands of individual units battling it out with fully simulated firing trajectories and nuclear ordnance. These games represent the biggest and widest opportunities to express logistical, tactical, and strategic know-how in a game without dipping into 4X. They also feature strategic zoom, which is the feature that I think most differentiates these games from any other in the genre. The maps are enormous, generally speaking, in the tens of kilometers, and you can zoom out to see all of it at once, unlike other RTS games where your face smashed into a tiny fraction of the map, which is a feature, frankly, so good and so downright genre-defining that I am offended by how many new RTS RTS games simply do not have it. Let me explain some of the similarities between these two games. First, in both games, you have a commander unit that is essentially you. Lose it, and you lose the game. In both games, this unit isn't necessarily a slouch in combat either, with some great micro-abilities. You use a streaming, constant inflow economy system to produce very large armies, tech up, build super units and map range artillery pieces, tower defenses, whatever. Go on raids and attacks, and blow up your enemy. These games both have co-op modes, and Subcom has a co-op campaign if that's your jam. In my view, however, all of these games truly shine as PvP games. They are much more engaging and dynamic, instead of being snooze-fest turtle parties that typical co-op games tend to devolve into when you're doing an RTS. Playing SimCity can definitely be fun, but it does get dry pretty fast. Adding clever players trying to mess with you while you mess with them creates incredible dynamism and entertainment value that will occupy you at your full faculties for hours on end. Let's start going a little bit more deep on Beyond All Reason. Zero K also exists. Both are free to play. Bar and Zero K are modernized RTSs meant to reflect the gameplay and design decisions that went into total annihilation. It's a fairly sophisticated update of what TA had to offer. Personally, I didn't jive as much with Zero K, and nothing against it, but it just didn't work for me, as much as BAR suited me. BR also has 30 versus 30 games on offer, and that is insanely cool. BR currently offers a lobby simulator, two factions, with a third in active development and well underway, full-scale land, air, and sea battles, and a compressed tech tree that goes from T1 buildings to T2 buildings, but provides game enders and T4 units at the top of the tech tree. Technology is progressed by constructing an engineer of the type that you prefer, then building the associated tech 2 factory of the same type. Another upshot for BAR is, on average, shorter game time. Times. Sure, the big long multiplayer games can take an age, but most of the games that I played getting used to this game were in the 20 minute range. That is the summary, we'll get into more details later, but I want to arm you with a few tools here. Below in my description is a link to a few casters who cover this game, uh, Brightworks Gaming and Winter Gaming TV, that will both familiarize you with the gameplay so you can decide if it seems cool. I also think that casts of these kinds of games are actually just really fun to watch, even when I barely understand what's going on, so I strongly recommend you check it out at the minimum. A guy named Ian did a review of this game that I thought was solid, and he's the reason I even heard about this game in the first place, so go check him out, and I've linked that below as well. Finally, there's a link to the description below where you can go to get the game, you just download it, set up some kind of account, create a lobby, make some AI to skirmish against for a game or two until you understand the raw basics, then join a noobs-only PvP game so you can see how garbage you are and get a thirst for improvement. Supreme Commander was released in 2007, and has a dedicated cult fan base for decades now, of which I'm a part of, I suppose. It's still eminently playable, and in my view, it is the best RTS ever made. The cult fanbase has actually 
made a mod for the game that is still maintained to this day called Forged Alliance Forever. It has added a bare few units and made many balance passes to help enhance the PvP experience to the maximum heights allowed within the existing game space without moving very far from the original design of the game. Because the simulation is single-threaded, more powerful and modern CPUs generally handle the game far better than it was handled on release. I certainly remember what some of those chugs were like when I was running out of my old piece of garbage once upon a time. But you still may run into some slowdowns in the truly massive games. Supreme Commander offers 8v8 max games, with 4v4 being the most common, seriously enormous maps maxing out at 80 kilometers squared, automatic ranked matchmaking for 1v1 through 4v4, as well as lobby-based matchmaking. It also has some incredible mapmaking tools and a new feature since I last played that helps keep the game very fresh, a map auto-generator for ranked and custom games. This generator is awesome and really helps break up the monotony of playing Seton's Clutch for the 17th year running. And yes, BAR also has a Seton's Clutch at home. Compared to BAR, the games tend to be longer and tend to offer larger battles with more units in play, and these sick formations. A tighter roster of units with more clearly defined roles that makes onboarding easier, and four unique factions with a fifth fan-made faction somewhere in development. A tech system that goes smoothly from one through four, upgrading where upgrading is done at the building level, and it is fully expected, unlike in BAR, that the individual player might have a mix of air and land and sea factories as the game has been balanced around unit production capacity being increased primarily through more factories, not more engineers. Oh, and the heightened scale of things means that instead of nukes looking like this, they look like this. If you're interested in getting Supreme Commander, you will need to buy Forged Alliance. This is a standalone expansion pack, which you can get on Steam for about 12 bucks. Sometimes it's on sale as well. You will then create an account for and install Forged Alliance Forever and link it to your Steam account. After that, you should be good to go and can play any faction. To help you get a sense of the game and gameplay, here's a few casters I've personally been watching, Guilecast and The Duelist, and I've linked a few of their videos below. All right, I've more than introduced the subject matter in what I hope was a pretty fast and concise way. Let me just talk to you about the differences between these two gameplay experiences so you can pick your poison if you don't want to try for both. Number one, both games do feature a recovery mechanic known as Reclaim. This can radically alter battles as enemy attacks can become mass and metal donations when executed poorly, and can allow a player who is under pressure the chance to bounce back and launch a new attack by reclaiming the wreckage of the enemy attack. In BAR, in addition to the Reclaim, there is actually ResBots, which allows the user to ad hoc rebuild combat units just behind the front lines, or stiffen a defense against attrition. 2. In BAR, ranges are incredibly short, and maps and game spaces are much smaller. This is meant to create a situation where you are looking at the actual units more and looking at the map and all its icons a little less. For some people, this may be a positive, but for me, I don't care if I'm staring at icons for everything other than the big fights I might zoom in on. I want to be doing exciting, grand-scale strategic combat and not close in night fights between 15 robots. In this sense, Supreme Commander appeals to me much more as a much more realistic feeling combat game with long-range artillery and fast-moving tanks. But these tighter engagements can be fun in their own right and I've had a lot of fun getting better at BAR than I was. Number three, Supreme Commander has a very pseudo-realistic aesthetic that I find more appealing, but there is definitely a charm to BAR's goofball toy box robot vibe. A lot of the units are significantly outlandish or references to one thing or another. You can't help but have a little bit of fun. Number four, unit numbers tend to be smaller in BAR over subcom, and to me that's a demerit. Subcom handles this added high unit count with formations, allowing easier management of large bodies of units. Number five, BAR's unit roster is at times pretty confusing. Supreme Commander has a very streamlined unit roster with less redundant unit variety, whereas BAR has a bot lab, a vehicle lab, a hover lab, alongside a seaplane and airplane factories, a naval factory, and a separate amphibious or submersible versions of some of these buildings. Supreme Commander just simplifies all this down to a land factory, air factory, and naval factory. Now, BAR has different scouts and tanks and hover tanks that all have different methods of combat and efficiencies to learn. Subcom just has scout and lab and the tank and the arty. And some units hover and others don't, and it's fast faction specific, so you can learn a faction and learn other factions, and you've got the gist of it out of the gate. The tank is the tank is the tank, and there's some idiosyncrasies, but you kind of get it. I personally prefer the simpler and more streamlined, carefully balanced version of design that Subcom brings to the table because it's easy to understand and manipulate at the higher level for gameplay. Not so worried about whether or not this tank is specifically efficient against this other unit that's specifically encountering. It's just kind of my big blob of units is doing this over here, and it's either big enough or not big enough, and I have to figure out how to manage the logistics better. However, the bar roster has 
its upside. In complexity and player options, in bar you simply have more options for how to get the job done, and as I have learned the game more deeply, many of these interactions can be fun in their own right, so I certainly don't want to minimize how much creativity that you can extract from these different unit interactions. I will say as an aside, BAR suffers from its own game design here a little bit. It's not really common in bar games to have more than one factory in a given game. The individual player rarely has both bots and vehicles and hover, whereas even though there's far fewer individual tech trees to climb in subcom, if you want to cross spec in subcom, that's totally fine. Bar just favors combined arms across its roster by making factories expensive and build power cheap, being focused within assisting engineers. Number six, commanders tend to be a lot squishier in bar. Their D-gun is incredibly strong, and they have a cloak on tap if you have energy, but they are not able to frontline with their low HP. Even a handful of tanks can rapidly annihilate them. Times to kill tend to be very short for all the units. On the other hand, in subcom, your commander it has a suite of available upgrades including guns and shields and health regeneration, and can become a downright early to mid-game terror all by itself. Given that losing your commander loses the game, this is a very engaging way to play. Speaking of dying, in bar in a team game, when your commander dies, it, you do not lose the game. You are only given the boot when all commanders are dead. Furthermore, commanders themselves can be rezzed or reclaimed. This leads to some weird techniques like the backline technology players intentionally blowing up their own commanders to eat the metal for production. The upshot of this is any given player can stay in the game until the game is a definitive loss, but it also means that commanders feel way less important and pulls you a bit out of the experience. Subcom solves the same problem by normalizing full share. This means that sniping an enemy commander removes that player and their APM, but also gives their remaining buildings to the highest ranked player, thus their eco, and that can be a double-edged sword. Smart executions in this case are critical, and I think both methods have their upsides and downsides. I don't have a favorite in this case. 7. Adjacency in subcom rocks as a mechanic. Unlike bar, where building bases is generally best done with substantial spacing to avoid chain reacts, space allowing, Subcommon actually encourages aesthetic geometric construction via adjacency bonuses. Let's say you have a factory that's consuming energy and you put a power plant right next to it. This adjacency bonus actually makes the energy consumption reduced and is thus more efficient. So now the question is, do you risk a chain react to play hot sim city with monetary advantages, or do you space things out to make them harder to kill? This is a good system and makes building a base a little bit more engaging. Number eight, game enders versus unit pushes. This will really be my final point as a difference here. I love fighting land games. Subcom tends to follow a very specific game pattern. And I'm going to be a bit reductive because the back and forth is also often where all the delightful drama takes place. However, in a typical game, the frontliners fight a stalemate war with a lot of back and forth until the air players have a big air fight. Someone wins the big air fight. The player or team that wins the air fight will then try to produce lots of bombers to kill enemy commanders. The player that loses the air fight usually tries to rush game enders in a last ditch effort to clutch victory from the jaws of defeat. Occasionally, the back foot team tries to get clever with some Hail Marys, and if that doesn't work, usually things become sort of a methodical destruction campaign of artillery strikes and so forth. The only time this doesn't happen is when a land stalemate cannot be maintained and one party manages to run over the air player's base with land units. The larger the map, the less likely this is going to happen. The same applies to naval games for the most part. In BAR, a huge number of the games I have watched end with someone rolling a ball of T2, T3, or T4 units through a bunch of bases. It's much more satisfying to watch, but does that mean that both of these games don't feature tremendous aesthetic and dynamic battles? No. All of these battles are always amazing to play, but knowing this pattern for subcom can result in somewhat stale end games. The early game is always up in the air, but you start to see the pattern after a few hundred games. That it's all like, yep, we lost this one, well in advance of the final blow. Basically, the end game of bar is cleaner, but both games play amazingly. So which do I personally prefer? For me, it's still Supreme Commander. Bar is an amazing game, and I will keep playing it. I really am looking forward to its full Steam release. I'm so happy this game got made, but Supreme Commander to me is a superior game. Aesthetic and some of its mechanics are superior in my view as well. In the end, I really wish someone had made a fan successor to Supreme Commander instead of Total Annihilation. Oh wait, they have. Let me introduce you to an ongoing project called Sanctuary. Set on a Dyson Sphere with three factions planned and honestly phenomenal graphics and aesthetics, this is the spiritual fan-made successor to Supreme Commander. It's not out yet, it's in pre-alpha, but it is funded by a dedicated bunch of investors and a Kickstarter, and I'm just really excited to tell you about it. It's no doubt far from done, with tons of work to do, but the core of the game looks to be well underway with units, buildings, and adjacency, and upgrade commanders, tech levels from 1 through 5, has all the things I want to see, plus in-game weather features and terrain destruction.
structure. The scale is really just right, and while I haven't had a personal opportunity to get my hands on it at all, I'm going to put a link in the description below of something that I did watch about it, and you can take a look as well. It's pretty exciting stuff, at least for someone like me who's been a big fan of Supreme Commander and Total Annihilation over the years. With that, we'll call it a wrap. I really appreciate your time and attention. If these games aren't for you, I totally understand it's a niche genre after all, but for those of you who are looking for something like this, hopefully I've turned you on to it, maybe I'll see you in one of these games. Have a lovely day everyone, thanks for visiting so much, Bye bye